And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, the man, the man who may or may not call himself the cock of the walk in the in the role-playing scene. The the head honcho of Rooster Games and creator of Fabula Ultima as well as way too many fan games. The Emmanuel Galetto, better known as Rooster Emma. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight in your case? Um, I'm doing well. Uh, it's like uh, 7 p.m. for me. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really have to agree. Too many fan games. That's that's really a good way to put it. Oh. Um, as as far as I, well, if, if I went through all the list, I w if I went through all the list, I would have had to do some deep some deep diving. Oh. Yeah. And some people could argue that Fabula Ultima itself is kind of a fan game. So. Oh. It it stays true, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's it certainly it certainly fits the pattern, but what would the tradition around here is to go is to go into humble beginnings. So, what was your first introduction to role playing games? Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, you mean tabletop role playing games, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I was like uh, eleven or twelve. Uh, and I had already started playing a little bit of uh, Warhammer uh, 40k and so basically I went to this little convention uh, here in Italy uh, like a really small thing uh, with a friend and um, there were tables of people you know playing card games people playing miniatures games and then there was this guy with uh, a few scraps of paper and like some notes uh, and it turns out uh, he was uh, testing a new game he was making uh, and like my friend I was with uh, had already heard of uh, uh, tabletop role-playing games um, probably because uh, of the um, Warhammer fantasy role-play uh, game mm -hmm. and we sat down to play and like it was a really um, minimalistic system uh, you had three stats and your scoring the stat also determined the amount of specializations that you could have. Like, if you had a three in a stat, uh, you would have three special things, you know, that were uh, that you were especially capable of. Uh, and the sum of those stats was like your spirit, uh, which acted as both your HP and a resource for uh, doing cool things like magic and stuff like that. But there weren't like many more mechanics other than that. And even when it came to character creation, I basically asked, you know, uh, I was familiar with video games, and so I asked what were my options. And I was I was told anything would work. And so I think uh, it, it was like a lizard man medic, like, but not a magical medic, like a, a surgeon. Uh, so yeah, my, my introduction to tabletop RPGs was very good for the future because instead of you know uh, coming into a strong brand such as again Warhammer or uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Call of Cthulhu, my first encounter was this indie game that wasn't even you know completely finished. And after that day, I basically copied that system and went on playing that kind of game with my friends for. I think like three years, like uh, until the end of middle school and the, the beginning of uh, high school. And um, in the meantime, I also started playing a bit of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay with this friend, uh, although it didn't really ever take off because it was just the two of us plus uh, his younger uh, brother. And so, um, but I, I did. I did basically came in, uh, come into contact with the um, with the idea that some tabletop RPGs had big books with a lot of options, and 
And then it was like when I was 15 that I played Dungeons and Dragons uh, 3.5 for uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. Oh, which is de which is definitely interesting. And the I will I will admit there that um I've always I've always de I've always delved just as much into fan works as official ones. And well. A lot of designers are going to use conventions as as a way to get some easy guinea pigs, as it were. <laughs> um, I don't like I don't like sugarcoating this kind this kind of thing. Let's call it what I mean, it is. We we we've also we we've always like uh, we are always in dire need of playtesters. Mm -hmm. That's that's a universal truth. <laughs> uh, I um I had I had a I had a very easy I had a very easy way to lure, to lure in playtesters because. I was dis I was discussing it with a buddy of mine. And he he said, "Why don't you offer Why don't you offer free food?" And I'm like, "You know what? Why don't I do that?" Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, because I I had already the the guy who runs my my LGS, who I have been frenemies with for about twenty years, has this weird tradition where the where um the first time you come in for game night, you have to bring him a sandwich. I have no okay. idea why I have no idea why you have to do this. That's it's just something you do. And everybody was giving him like ham and cheese or peanut butter and jelly. Then I come in and I give him a Reuben. <laughs> so, you know, because because I figured I figured nobody else was doing that, and he probably was he probably was sick of the expected. So I'm so I'm gonna do something different. Absolutely. And, and at first at first he. He tr at first he tried to, he tried to act like he was disappointed that it w that it was a Reuben, but he, but he figured out pretty quickly that he wasn't going to be able to bluff me. <laughs> at least at least not that easy. You know the, you know the old saying, "Don't bullshit a bullshitter." Yeah. <laughs> but because and truth and truth be told, um, I've d I've dug around enough to to know that there that um. In fan pro fan projects are not something to be slept on, especially especially ones that really go the extra mile. Um, one of the more infamous ones that I've covered on this channel is the Dungeons the Dragoning experiment. I see. Which, if you're not familiar with that, imagine somebody mixing World of Darkness, Seventh Sea, Exalted, D and D, and Warhammer Forty Thousand, specifically Dark Heresy. Into a blender and making it work. Yeah, that's. I, I. I think. I think the Greeks would use hubris as a word to <laughs> describe this process. But <laughs> I'll have. I. I'd. Ha I'd. I'd have. I'd have to. Ha I'll ask Angelos the next time I speak to him because, yes, he. Yes, even. Gre even Greece is not immune to having people visit my temple. Oh, because I've had I've had An Angelos Crip Cripianos on uh, from um, Spiral Lane. He's the, he's developed Meteor Tales and um, Grimstone. Like I guess, like I, I said, see. I am I'm a bit worldwide when it comes to this thing. And that's that's a great thing, actually. Like uh, to to address you know one of the elephants in the room, if you will, uh, and like the. the the um, Fabula Ultima winning uh, the Gold Annie for best game. Mm -hmm. What what actually makes me happy uh, is I I really want to see um, more non North American games. You know, uh, get that kind of result. So like I'm happy for Fabula Ultima, but I I want to see more of these. I want to see more nominations. I want to see more. Uh, not really just. It's not really a matter of the award. Uh, but I want the the recognition, you know, uh, and the like, the diffusion that comes from that to to apply to um, to games from all all areas of the world. So the fact that you say, you know, you uh, have had guests from all over the world, I think that's that's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that that's a that's something to treasure. I've I've also been um, I've been I've been campaigning. For the longest time, when it comes to Japanese tabletop, and mm. most most recently, have, having 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 a bit of my 
one of my big white whales was um, Sword World. And over the last okay. e over the last year, I discovered a group that has been um, doing fan translations of um, oh yeah of, of the and of the material. They just recent they just recently put out a a new thing with the Outlaw book. If it's if it's the same group that I know, they've even gone to the uh, land of actually, you know, doing the layout. So yeah. it's not just uh, it's not just a, a word document. They're actually doing redoing the the layout, and that's that's an amount of like work and effort that I can really respect. I'm I'm a big fan of fan translations. I'm a big fan of you know retro gaming emulation all the stuff that lets more people uh, experience a, a given game or a given work of art i think is is super important mm -hmm. and in the in and of course uh, in the of course in the spirit of that when um as ri as ridiculous as it is when made um had got, had gotten print had gotten printed i jumped i jumped on that the first chance i got i've I've been I've been a ardent supporter of Anima, which is which comes from which um was that was that crazy project out of Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Anima um, Beyond Fantasy. I've I've a t I have done I've I did I did a review of the one of my one of my better reviews I, f I feel was the time I covered um Dashwars Anka or the Dark Eye. Um I have I have in, I have hinted that I would l that I would like to see, um, I would like to see Luke I would like to see Luca De Marini do do a do an English translation of, um, Destino Obscuro, um, which is this which is the system from where some of the stuff he, that his company has put things out in English have um, ha have have um sprung from namely. Uh, Musha Shugyo and um, Augusta Universalis. Um, yeah. Like there, there's. I've always, I've always been a tre a um, a treasure hunter of sorts. I was, I was that person who would go into a library uh, at ten at ten in the morning, and I wouldn't leave until closing. And once the once I got a hold of the internet, I just scaled up. <laughs> yeah, nowadays I guess uh, itch.io is is kind of a place where you can go really deep in that kind of sort of rabbit hole. Like y you can go scavenging for games and and get some pretty interesting stuff. Like sometimes I happen, you know, you're you're like scrolling through these hundreds of projects, and and sometimes something pops up pops out from it, and and you're like. Really? No one is talking about this. How? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, it's sometimes it's. I, I admit that there are times in which it makes me a bit sad uh, because it really shows that you know there's there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort into games, and when I see those games being really not really talked about. I, I tend to, you know, uh, talk about them on Discord, uh, talk about them on Telegram, in the various communities. I try to spread the word, uh, retweet if, if they have a Twitter and, and maybe did an update or something. Um, because I, I really think, especially in the uh, tabletop RPG context, uh, more teamwork, more cooperation between uh, designers would be welcome. Um, you know, um, basically uh, shout outs to each other's and and our work, and uh, there's also uh, um, there's also a lot of projects that don't see you know print because printing has especially after the the pandemic uh, the choice to do a print run or some of something is demanding. Uh, you need to print it, you need to store it, like if you don't have a, a place for storage, uh, that's that's going to be a problem, and then you need to ship it. And every single step of this has been made more expensive by the pandemic, uh, so it, it all kind of stacks together, and in the end you get a multiplier that most people just, you know, won't be able to, to sustain. I started this... On 
when on the 20 the 27th will be the ninth year anniversary of me starting this channel and I started it because I because I shared that frustration but I did I took the approach of well if, if nobody's gonna do it then uh, then I'm just I'm just going to do it myself um, classic the whole, the whole if you want something done right it's, be, it's best to do, it's best to do it yourself which some sometimes works and sometimes you get you get a case like say St Stephen King um try, trying to do a movie while coked out of his mind <laughs> even which even he admitted when it came to maximum overdrive he barely remembers what he did with that movie because he was because of how much coke he was doing we appreciate the honesty <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I ended I ended up used when I did when I was when I was running um when I was running the strange I ended up I ended up using the line in back in the eighties Stephen King did ha did half of the world's cocaine but there are but there are more worlds than this one I was I, I admit I did not know about this so this is all new to me. <laughs> Some t sometimes when it comes to c when it comes to the creation of a work, the chaos behind the scenes is as much of a fascinating story as the final product. Um, I suppose I suppose one I suppose one of the biggest examples of this is the filming of Apocalypse of Apocalypse Now. And oh how yeah. And how much of an call calling the behind the scenes of that a nightmare is almost cute. Oh. Um, yeah, fun fact that that also applies to games, and I I maintain that any game that you actually see, not even on a shelf, like even any game that you see completed uh, online, even just in PDF form, is basically a miracle. Oh, I I am I am well aware, and I've. I've said that ev even if they don't want to admit it, um, all game designers are on some level masochists. Oh yeah, no, like yeah, I I I have no trouble admitting it. Like, <laughs> and not not my specific kink, but I have to admit that yeah, in in the way like the way I conduct myself in life, I definitely take on a lot of burdens and and especially. In, in times of in, in terms of thinking, uh, I hyper criticize and hyper examine anything that I do and the ramifications and like the the cognitive load on my brain is pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. But and in, in I was able to, I was able to get away with in that joke because well the strange is all about dim, is all about dimension hopping. Oh yeah, but and I usually I usually um I spent I spent a bit of time I spent a bit of time over the years teaching people so te so teaching people through YouTube was just a nat was just a natural step though I did I did still want I did still want to maintain that I'm not, that um I'm not going to be hi I'm not going to be hyper -fo I didn't want to hyper focus on the ease on the easy material. Because even though I've even though I've covered plenty of third-party D and D stuff, I haven't. When it comes to expansions to D and D proper, I've I haven't covered I haven't covered any of it. <laughs> I did I did a review I did a admittedly t admittedly not my best review of fifth edition proper. Um, and that and that and that was just to get it out of my system and get it over with. I have I have two friends, in, two dear friends in Italy. Uh, they um, basically they have a page uh, that's called Morgengabe, uh, where they do you know they talk about TRPGs. And um, by the way, you might not know the name, but they are basically responsible for most of Italy's uh, successful Kickstarter campaigns. In TRPGs and in board games a bit too, and yeah. and so basically they have this professional side which is you know crowdfunding and stuff, and then they have this non-commercial non-profit side where they do videos and stuff about RPGs, and their motto is plenty of people talk about D and D, we talk about the rest. 
um, which isn't, you know, it's wrong to take to talk about D and D. It's like, you know, why why be more of the same? Um, which is, in in my opinion, it's also an acknowledgement that mm, they are not the right people to talk about D and D because personally they are not D and D players. So yeah, I've. I will. St- I will still. I will still. Dis- I will still discuss certain certain design motifs because, well, you pro- you probably read the Art of War. You know, know know your enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I did read uh, Art of War. Oh. And and it's one of one of one person who I've cited quite who I've cited quite a bit in in work is Vincent Flanders, who. For di- for over fifteen years, had made had maintained a page called Web Pages That Suck, because his the thing that he teaches is web usability. Okay, and, I I didn't know the name, but I do know Web Pages That Suck. Yeah, yeah. the idea is teaching good teaching good web design by showing bad. And I will look. I will. Look, so it's important to it's important to look look at the pitfalls that other people have fallen into, so you know what not to do. That's that's a pretty big deal, and also I, I know that um, especially nowadays where a conversation runs fast and you have a limit on the amount of uh, you know uh, characters you can use in a message, um, it's easy to to see that as bashing someone else's work, and it it seems you know contradictory with what I said before that every game that gets released is basically a miracle. And I really say this in the like in the most in the kindest way. Uh, people mess up a bunch, and they make a lot of bad decisions. And I'm the same. And we like there's a difference between you know making a list, pointing out uh, flaws, and condemning the individual that made those mistakes. Like those are two different things, uh, especially because. Often enough, when you see a finished product, a finished item, uh, the person who made it is already beyond that. So they're probably improving as well. Uh, so obviously, you need to make criticism in the in the right way. But saying that something is bad and providing reasons why is not bashing it. Like it, it's not bad. Uh, and one of the first things that I try to teach people, uh, I'm. I've been recently. I've been uh, not really teaching design, but I've started, you know, uh, running workshops and and stuff like that. And and the first thing that I teach is to be okay with just messing up, you know, like recognizing your failures, being able to take uh, feedback and criticism, distinguishing, of course, between uh, criticism and like people being mean, because those those are two different things. Uh, but like this getting used to being told that something you made doesn't work and on one side improving and on the other accepting that anything you make will be will be flawed like in in some measure uh don't get too attached I it's met- it's tough because yeah. you know you you need to to love the work that you do but you also need to accept that it's going to be flawed the first tabletop project I ever made was a card game called Legend Wars. No one is ever going to see that thing because it sucked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Same, my... same actually. Uh, like, in, in middle school, you know, when, when I was talking about discovering uh, TRPGs for the first time, at the same time, I was also discovering uh, collectible card games, and we actually um, made our own rule set with a couple of friends in, in class. Uh, and we were cutting and drawing and writing by hand every single individual card. And I can tell you, there's no way to understand an actual system by looking at those cards. They seem to entirely reference different games. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. and. My my mentor, who I've lovingly given the nickname "Old Man Bullhorn" because of how, because of how he would speak, he wouldn't he wouldn't yell at people, but because he worked with a lot of folks who were hard of hearing, the best way I can describe it is he would project his voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 
he would always he would always say the first thing you do sucks. <laughs> and and I think that's good because just like bear with me for a moment. Mm -hmm. Is there any scarier thought that than your first thing being the best one that you ever will make? Like that scares me. If if the first thing you do is the best one in your life, that means that the rest of your life will be perceived as you failing and failing and failing to live up to your first work. Yeah. So <laughs> I remember there there was a short story by get by um Gary Paulson, God rest his soul, uh, called The Rifle which talked about the talked about a legend among gunsmiths called a sweet rifle which is one that is one that is so well made that they could never make something like it again in their life. Um, and it does it's treat it's treated as this mythological thing am, among gunsmiths but in re, but in reality it's it's a it was a double-edged sword in that story because a, a lot of the people who had who ended up having the had, having that rifle they didn't they didn't last large largely because they because they thought they were untouchable because of the fact that they had that rifle. Yeah. Um uh, and as as odd as it may sound to bring up something like that in the con in a conversation about a about about a video game influenced influenced RPG. Um it is I go through I go through just about everything to get to get ideas, even even looking at a ban at abandoned firearm designs to say, could I sci-fi this up and make it work? Hmm, yeah. <laughs> um, Caltech has provided me a lot of in a lot of inspiration when it comes to that because Caltech has never made a good-looking gun. They, their stuff works. It's just it's ugly. <laughs> but I do, given that there given that there was. A um a short list of inspirations that's within the core book for Fabula Ultima. Um, I did want to go. I did want to go through a handful of a handful of them and kind of kind of do a bit of a lightning round with them. Okay. Um. So I will bring up a name and you tell you tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Something you remember as a standout. Something that was um that wasn't that that you. That you integrated into into Fabula. Okay, so basically the the defining element that Fabula inherited from that inspiration. Okay. Yeah, okay. think think of it as the nerdiest Rorschach test you've ever taken. Okay. <laughs> nice. Um, thirteenth age. Thirteenth age. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, what's it called the one unique thing. Mm -hmm. And and in general, the background being a substitution for skills, mm -hmm. which I I will I will state I've I've always believed that D and D was never designed with a skill system, and I know I know some people say what about these skills that doesn't count. Th those are special abilities, and that, that's a different thing. Like they're they're the set of special mechanics. Yeah, well, uh, you you didn't really <laughs> see a. You can you kind of saw a skill system with the proficiency system in AD and D second, but it yeah. was undercooked. You didn't yeah. see a skill system as we know it until third, and that's why I say it wasn't built with it in mind, as opposed to say, World of Darkness, where you have an attribute skill formula from the word go. My my fave, by the way, is uh, Moldvay when it comes to old D and D. Uh, or uh, fourth edition when it comes to more recent DLC. Yeah, those are my two favorite editions. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised to see Aegis. I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of people reference that. Yeah, uh, I. It might surprise you, but probably not. Uh, but there was a fair bit of study behind Fable Ultima, like um, not just studying video games, but studying tabletop RPGs that emulated not just Final Fantasy games or, you know, uh, JRPGs uh, as, as broad as that term and concept can be, uh, but, like, there was a lot, 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 lot of studying. And Aegis was my way of studying, uh, especially, um, 
especially Alberto's design, because the designer of Aegis is uh, Alberto Tronchi, uh, who is also a, a dear friend. Um, he's all he's the kind of designer who doesn't really put in a rule unless it has to be there. <laughs> and like I, I wanted to see. Uh, I, I follow a similar philosophy, so I wanted to see how he condensed uh, the structure of the narrative. And so when I when I think about Aegis, I really uh, the, the the first thing that comes to mind in terms of an influence is the simplicity, mm -hmm. like you know, cutting down to the to the core. Yeah. Um. And now now what? The next one I am very familiar with, especially since I covered it on this on this channel twice. Um, Anima Prime. Okay, yeah, from Anima Prime, uh, the um, the big one was uh, the focus on themes, like character themes, which in in Anima actually have each 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 one has their own rules mm -hmm. because they charge your dice, uh, but. The, the idea of giving, keeping themes as this kind of central driving force and the other, uh, the other major influence was Anima Prime basically tells you during conflicts, mechanics. Outside conflicts, talk about it. And that carries, carries over very much into Fabula. Like you have mechanics for out of conflict stuff, uh, but Usually, you don't roll much uh, in in scenes that aren't about you know the the tense conflict. And another thing it has in common with uh, with Anima Prime uh, is to use conflict instead of combat as the situation. So like to really diversify the the gaming experience uh, between high mechanic and low mechanic rather than fighting and not fighting. I remember, um, I remember the guy, the guy behind um, Final Fantasy Fourth, Final Fantasy RPG Fourth Edition had a similar mindset. Yes, and I will. Final, Final Fantasy Fourth uh, is the one that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, Final Fantasy Fourth had an influence. Mm -hmm. The the fan project had an influence in uh, group types. Group types were a, a major influence, and. Um, I really, I really like the, because uh, the third uh, Final Fantasy uh, fan-made the, the th yeah, the third edition was like this massive thing that basically required a, a CPU or device to keep track of everything, and the fourth instead like had the bravery to overhaul the entire thing, and I was really, really, really intrigued because you know what's best. Than looking at one game, the best thing is looking at two games that attempt to do the same thing in completely different ways, and seeing where they match and where they they diverge, and basically you you can see the you can read to, through the brain of the people that worked on it, mm -hmm. and and seeing the same uh, narrative trope or the same uh, vibe in terms of technique or combat or mechanics and see it interpreted in two completely different ways is super important when when you are researching for a game design. Yeah. Um now Ap Apocalypse Apocalypse World that one, that one is that one is a vi is a very broad affair so that one I'm go I'm going to skip over because the one that's after that is, yeah, one, is one that's going to be interesting. I will say hmm. the influence was basically uh, the idea of training uh, players and game masters, you know, providing principles. Mm -hmm. That was the big influence. Yeah. But Ari and Hod, I, d I, do want, I do want to bring up, especially since I... There's, there's, a, lot of in there's a lot of interesting motifs within uh, within a lot of the output that fear puts out since fe I'd say fear is the is is one is one of the two big fear and group s and e are the two big dogs in um ja yes. in the Japanese tabletop by far. scene by far yes and I've seen some fan translations of, of Arian Hod, but that's as far as I was able to go 
Indeed, um, Extant Lily uh, is a member of my Discord who is also uh, the designer of all the uh, villains in the High Fantasy expansion. And they actually translated a lot of the classes from Aryan Road and a lot of the rules. And I've had the luck to, to, you know, to be given access to that drive. And this was extremely interesting. Uh, and what I got from Aryan Road was basically the uh, skill level structure, like the way you build the character by grabbing different skills and leveling them up as you wish. Mm. And they have like this kind of mathematical formula, you know, for uh, for scaling. And I will also cite uh, a minor influence that I love very much: the uh, painful lesson skill that Darkblade has in uh, in Fable Ultima comes from a skill that monks have. Uh, I guess. I can't remember if it's Gladiator or Pugilist, I can't remember the name, but that class in Aryan Rod has the ability to make uh, studying checks through uh, might, through physical stats, when damaged. Mm -hmm. And that was like such a great, like, because, you know, it's, you, you take the kind of action that the physical character would never do in the average expectation of players and you put it on them as a free action like it's even more efficient in terms of action economy and that was like I, I loved it so much and it could have gone into Fury in Fable Ultima but it ended up uh, going into Darkblade because well first Darkblade has a strong as a strong theme of suffering and then you know getting stronger from it and uh, but Darkblade ultimately is all about uh, having suffered something and uh, having understood and gained power from it. So thematically, the idea that not only they know pain, but when they experience a new form of it, they can glimpse a lot of information from that. Uh, it was just really cool. And also it, it enabled maybe the, the, the silliest and actually very effective build in Fable Ultima, which has been uh, dubbed the Dark Blade with an O, uh, because you pick Lore Master and Dark Blade and basically use a Painful Lesson to study as a free action. So <laughs> you you are a nerd, but you are also a Dark Blade, which makes you a masochistic nerd, which I guess it makes you a game designer at this point. We, we have agreed that <laughs> that's the result. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so nah, and um, I, I will admit my first introduction to Fear and, and the SRS system was when um, Koto Dama had translated and, and published uh, Double Cross. Yeah, yeah. Which in itself in itself is a, is a interesting beast that I hope to deep dive into um, down the road. Yeah, but, I don't know if people are aware, but uh, actually like the SRS system is basically has its own SRD uh, and it can be found online uh, and it's open to, to develop with and that uh, SRD actually had an influence on Fabula as well because what would you expect from an, an SRD like in, in the first section I don't think you would expect what you find in the uh, SRS SRD because the first section is conducting a game session and it opens with a flowchart which includes preparation and like preparing the area and helping the facilitator and it ends with helping clean the space where you played. Which is like, on one end, it seems silly to like point that out in an, in an SRD for like, because people would like, this is not about the system, this is just a social, you know, being, being, uh, uh, this is about uh, proper behavior and, and like helping people uh, and etiquette. Uh, but one of the reasons why Fabula Ultima doesn't take for granted that you know the social aspects that TRPGs entail comes from that. Because I was like, yeah, this, this sounds like it would be obvious, but I've seen enough groups 
get stumped, you know, on the simplest human social stuff. So maybe we should talk about this. Maybe we shouldn't take for granted, especially because, you know, uh, if a game is in English, it's gonna it's gonna go around the world, and social contexts are gonna change. So maybe we should talk about you know our expectations for this social context of a specific game. I have always joked about the idea of making something idiot proof because the the universe will create a bigger idiot. Obviously, yeah, and, yeah. Um, I you. I've been I've been around in I've I spent my childhood around insur around insurance agencies and I have I have seen on more on more than one occasion someone um cl someone claim that they weren't planning on having an accident and if that <laughs> yeah. if that sounds like a contradiction well because <laughs> it is but <laughs> I always knew when some when somebody said it because that because because people are trying really hard to not laugh and it goes into the level of are you familiar with the term corpsing from theaters? No, I I'm not. If you're playing a corpse on st on stage, you're supposed oh, to not okay. move at all. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Corpse So that's that's what you do when someone says that and you try not to laugh. Okay, I get yeah, it. <laughs> you're you're supposed it's called that because you're supposed to be playing a corpse, but speaking from personal experience, anytime you do that, everybody is going to try and make you crack. Yeah, because people will definitely notice. Like normally, a person isn't motionless. Like, <laughs> so it it shows. Yeah, uh, but I I want to clarify. This is not really about making you know the game idiot proof or stuff like yeah. that. Uh, it's it's more about you know not taking things for granted. And from my experience, from what I've seen, you know, when people actually read uh, Fabula, uh, it it seems many things that I decided to write, even though I thought they could be taken for granted, I, I actually did well to write them. And in fact, not enough. Uh, that's why like when the Game Master Kit comes out and it has a booklet that talks about, you know, uh, being a Fabula Ultima Game Master, like, the, you know what section uh, is the first section in that one? It, it's... It, it, the title is "Let Yourself Be Helped," which you would be like, "Is this like a self-improvement book or a Fabula Ultima book?" And it's actually kind of connected. Like TRPGs are so social that you end up basically telling people, you know, encouraging them and and trying to give them. You, you end up giving them life advice when you're actually just talking about a game. <laughs> In theory, uh, but they really like the 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 um, the border between those two things is really really thin. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, what I was I was gonna bring up Bla Blades in the Dark, but you kind of already answered that by saying that you that that's where you got the clock uh, mechanic. Yeah, so... uh, Blades in the Dark was influenced for clocks and for uh, again uh, the clear listing of principles. You mm -hmm. know. And, and expectations. Those yeah. those were a big deal. So instead, I'll bring up um, Burning Wheel. Yeah, the entire structure and basically the the underlying philosophy when crafting the Fable Ultima book was taken from uh, from Crane's Burning Wheel, because Burning Wheel is exactly uh, structured in the same way. Uh, it begins with um, an introduction about what this is. And then it gives you the rules for checks and it tells you, listen, in theory, you could resolve everything with it. And then it gives you a, a little bit more complicated rules for uh, opposed checks. And then it gives you, you know, there's this kind of climb and Fable Ultima does the same thing. It has checks and then it talks about, you know, opposed checks, group checks, open checks. And then it talks about clocks and then it talks about conflicts and none of those resolution methods are actually tied to a specific action in the fiction because you could resolve an entire combat as a group check you could resolve it as a clock probably two clocks mm -hmm. or you could resolve that as a full-on conflict scene which might have clocks inside of it 
and will have multiple checks. So it's really like the decision of how to resolve a, a given action has nothing to do with the action itself and has everything to do with basically this uh, zoom, the, the level of zoom that you want to um, you want to give that action. Like, do you want this action sequence to be something that would last 10 minutes in a movie or would that last just, you know, a couple frames? How important is this? And many people actually struggle with that because, uh, well, those who come from Dungeons and Dragons have the problem of having built this habit of we do violence and then this means we are all initiative and, you know, actions and turns and all that stuff um but i i like to think about it in a and and explain it in a more cinematic way uh you wouldn't resolve uh han solo and luke skywalker grabbing the two stormtroopers and you know knocking them out to steal the uniforms you wouldn't resolve that as a combat encounter not even in dungeons and dragons that would just be a check and you and then you get you know into the old debate about uh should i allow someone to one shot an enemy if they get the jump on them if we already have rules for combat why am i allowing an assassin let's say to uh, kill someone in a single act and basically just like burning wheel does the point isn't about verisimilitude or even game balance. The point is, if this thing is important, you know, the, the more important it is, the more it sh it should have a cost in resources and it should probably involve more complex and detailed mechanics. So Burning Wheel really is, is at the core of how I make content for Fabula. Uh, just the, the idea that you have all these optional rules that are provided by the game, it, it doesn't expect people to provide, you know, homebrew and come up with their own options to fix or uh, alter the, the structure of the game. If you don't use any of the optional rules in Fabula Ultima, it works. If you introduce the optional rules, it changes, but it still works. And then if you want, you can, yeah, do your own homebrew. but. I wanted to provide, you know, a foundation that let people actually tinker with the game within the confines of the game instead of immediately having to go, you know, house rules and homebrew. My policy on um, house on house rules and homebrewing has always been it's a spice, not the main dish. And exactly, exactly, yeah. Consider how ev consider how everybody clowns on Beth on Bethesda for how. In order to, in order to make Skyrim playable, you need a, you need an ass load of mods in order to make it work. Or same thing. And if that's too high profile an example, I'll throw in Stalker, which is which is an even worse culprit of that problem. Uh, like I, I've if I'm if I'm running if I'm running Stalker, there's like there's like four or five different mods that I have to that I have to put in just to make the thing work on modern um on modern setup. And even then, it's well, it's a, it's a it's Slav jank. You get you <laughs> you get ex you get exactly what you have coming. Yeah. But it's but it's the case of if we're gonna it, it's hypocritical of of us to um treat to treat something like Skyrim as a whipping boy for this problem, but brush it under the rug when it comes to role playing games. Yeah. Um. I think. I mean, of course, it, it comes down to, you know, uh, how I view the responsibility and role of a designer. Uh, but I, I am a big, I, I am pretty big about the responsibility that a designer has to provide a finished thing. Doesn't mean it's perfect. That's, you know, we, we, we must not go into the excess, you know, and, if you want, if you want to like see what happens when somebody tries to make a perfect game, look at Chris Roberts. <laughs> uh, what what game is that again? Um, I'm specifically referring to Star Citizen. Okay. Yeah, but basically we have this responsibility because we know, and I'm going to say something that might sound controversial, but it really isn't and shouldn't you be. You would not be we the first. We know more than the average player about games, okay? But 
designers don't know more about games than the average player because we are you know ex exceptional or talented we just we put in the hours like we put in the work and we learned stuff and one thing we often fail at as designers is communicate that uh, while we are more experienced we we are playful with it like we want you to play with it and play with the stuff that we make uh, of course this can change depending on designer but when it comes to me uh, I like when people play with the stuff but I I want them to understand the thing first mm. and that's that's why uh, the book tells you that yes you can change rules but a you should do this only when everyone agrees and that also should be obvious uh, in my point of view like when you meet with your friends to play football even if if it's just a friendly match you won't have one person come up come up with you know different rules and everyone has to uh, follow them you will discuss things uh, which obviously means that one person will probably you know suggest uh, and and then there's some negotiation and maybe you try and maybe you see that it doesn't work but it has to be a team effort and second of all you should first think that maybe things if things work the way they they do there's probably a reason and like maybe you you are you are yet to understand it you are yet to explore enough of the game to see why that limitation that you don't like actually makes it work like some some humility uh is really goes a long way um, and and this is also you know with video games it's a bit easier because they can enforce the rules more easily mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's plenty of people that you know play the first hour of a video game and they're like no this this doesn't work and like it actually kicks in on the second hour of course what you could also say is if it doesn't look good in the first hour there's a mistake and I'm kind of I, I kind of agree, but I'm kind of against that because I see all acts of creation as art, and art is self-expression, and I and people should be free to express, you know, their vision for a game, uh, however they want. For instance, we were talking about Burning Wheel, and one thing about Burning Wheel is that you won't understand that TRPG before like at least the seventh session. And like there's entire whole campaigns that don't last that long mm -hmm. so it's a game that just you know when you make a game you have to accept that it's gonna be for some people and not for other people and that's just how it is that's uh, that's the reason i i stopped do, i'm not sure if you've seen any of the full-on reviews that i've done but in my early days i was doing an out of 10 score but when i re when i um when i rebooted my approach Instead, I operated on a tier system, and it was less about how good or bad a given game is, and instead, how how many asterisks do I ha do I have to put on it when recommending it to people, and who would I recommend it to? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's easier and and I think more useful and also respectful of people's time to present you know the pros and cons. Like the, the numerical rating isn't really, and even just the pros and cons, you should list them in detail because maybe some people will see a con that they think is a pro, or a pro that they think is a con. Those and, and those so are like, things I put in as your mileage your mileage may vary, because um, I'm I'm approaching it the I'm approaching it like a tailor. If that if that makes sense. I don't... I'm not sure I get it, so please elaborate. You know, it... When a tailor is, when a tailor is making a, a suit for somebody, they are, they are measuring them, they're, they're making conversation to get, their, to get their preferences. Basically, any little detail they can to get to get them the, get them the suit that's going to match whatever, um, whatever, whatever occasion or whatever function the suit the suit is going to be for whether it's a daytime thing whether it's an evening thing whether it's with the um how 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 much mobility is going is going to be needed and if and if I'm, if I'm if i sound like i'm referencing the the taylor scene in john wick 2 well it's a, well it's a good frame of reference to utilize <laughs> 
But yeah, okay. I, I think I get. I think I get what what you mean. Uh, but surely, it's... when you provide a, a review, basically you want to give that information to the listener. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not. Pu I'm not putting myself as the B as the be all and end all with with it. It's more of this is this is my uh, this is my assessment based on who I th who I think it who I think is going to be for what um how. E the when I mentioned the asterisk, that's more of how how much house ruling would would you possibly have to do to, to deal with certain flaws? because um, some some games you're going some games are gonna need to be house ruled more more than others. Looking at yeah. new rifts, <laughs> I I always you you brought like you brought my mind to uh, when I when I hear people and and trust me, uh, like. 90% of the reviews and let's read and stuff about Fable Ultima, I've watched them, I've read them. Mm. Um, even if I don't comment, and, and I often do actually, I, I often do comment or, or share or, or drop a like, uh, but sometimes I... It, it's really one of those games that either it clicks or it doesn't. And when it doesn't, I, I have this moment of, you know, like Lovecraftian horror, when you're like, am, am I even human? I, am I talking to people like me? W what language am I speaking? Because I've seen some takes that are just, like they misinterpreted every single part of the premise. And, and I don't think they were doing this, you know, on purpose. Like, I don't think it was malice. I, I think I really didn't get through to to those people, Have... and mm -hmm. and and like uh, it's it's kind of terrifying because you know I'm like my job is about communication, communicating rules, communicating um, experiences, and kind of fostering a, a given perspective, and I'm always kind of evaluating if it's me. If it's you know the the zeitgeist, the the default understanding of what a TRPG is, because I've seen people talk about Fabula Ultima like, yeah, it was a lazy hack of Ryutama that took away the iconic elements like the Ryujin or the complex travel uh, travel rules, and just slapped a bunch of anime art on it to sell it uh, to a uh, and and to and and. Other people that say that it's like uh, targeted at it. It, ha it does some weird things uh, for a for a game uh, that should be targeted at people that are um, uh, what's what's the term? Uh, uh, well, people that have dropped out of Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, man, I I've begin I've, I've begun working on this five years six years seven years ago at this point and all i wanted to do was like trying to make the game that i i wanted to play when i when i wasn't happy playing dnd 3.5 because i kept uh, putting in you know stuff from from final fantasy like elemental weaknesses and stuff like that trying to make that stuff work but it never worked and that was my mistake obviously because dnd isn't about that stuff it's not designed for, for that stuff. Square peg and, and round hole. Yeah, yeah, and and like uh, this is like as much me processing that kind of uh, unhappiness and it's also me trying to get people to be a JRPG party in real life. Like not the characters, the players, including the game master, have to work together, you know, kind of understand each other's quirks and kind of learn to love each other and each other's ideas to kind of fight against this final boss that is mistrust in in this day and age the the willing the, the will to control for the game master the uh, the lure of being passive players for players like uh, it's really it really it, it's a game that was born from asking myself the question can i trust other people with creativity when i play like does it have to be a tug of war of or can it be collaboration and then came you know patreon and then came people play testing it and then came the interest from neat games and then came the budget to actually have artwork 
not from anime artists, but from artists that work in the JRPG style, which is, I know that uh, JRPG is a, is, a, is a loaded term, but I contend that it's not just, you know, Akihiko Yoshida and Yoshitaka Amano, those influences, the, the Final Fantasy style is not just anime. It is influenced by um, Liberty and uh, Art Deco and, and various different styles. So like, n not just making it look legit, but getting people involved from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And and eventually, uh, even the, the, the demo tutorial the target is not tabletop RPG players. Uh, it's actually video game players. It, the entire game is actually written for people who are uh, video game players and want to try tabletop RPGs. It's I, I never once in the entire process think uh, thought you know uh, this is the game that I'm gonna like that that is gonna steal people from Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. because people have read. Fabula Ultima in the light of the, well, the entire mess that was the OGL and, you know, yeah. we, we, we know what the beginning of 2023 was uh, when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons. And yep, I was, at I was at ground zero for all of that. And, and yeah, like, and Fabula Ultima kind of came to attention during that period but it's a game that was finished in early 2020, the core book at least, and it was supposed to come out in Italian and English in 2020. So like none of what people uh, say in those videos is actually true. <laughs> and it's, it's really funny because uh, what it, I it makes me think, you know. What I see from what you described is, so is something I've been very critical of because a lot, a lot of people. It's very easy to be critical of, 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 of say the bit of, of when, of when bigger companies make make their screw ups or when, cre or when certain creators make their screw ups. But, um, I, I put my barbs just as much on the on the community as I do as I do on everything else, because, I've stated before, I'm a big I'm a big believer in total equality. I may be an ass, but I'm an equal opportunity ass. <laughs> and because <laughs> the the shots are fired 360 degrees. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody, nobody gets special, tr nobody gets special treatment or, or anything, li anything like that. Um, if I if I'm a no I I'm, if if I'm annoyed at a bad if I'm annoyed at a bad joke, I'm annoyed at it be I'm annoyed at it as a comedian instead instead of anything else. And. I have been very critical of what I what my co what my co-host and I have called performative cynicism. Um cuz because as far as far and the and that sort that sort of that sort of gr grumbling grumbling about about how about how new new bad old good and and similar matters we we've done in, we've done entire episodes of the podcast ra railing on the, on that on that type of thinking and how and the and how i've seen where the, where that sort of that sort of you have to do things a certain way mindset leads that's the reason that's one of the big reasons why racing video games are in the sorry state that they're in Be and it, and it's interesting because you mentioned you know the idea of doing things a certain way mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people have like uh, read much of the advice in Fabula Ultima as you have to do this a certain way. This way, they, they had to do this because uh, they are selling to the North American public. Like there's also this big focus on North America, USA, Canada as like the market. And I'm like, folks, the world is a big place. I don't talk to you specifically. Like, <laughs> oh, <I'm... laughs> it's it's strange. It's interesting, of course, <laughs> because you, like you can't help but have people, you know, be informed by the time and place they live in. I was uh, I was but... a big fan of I was a big fan of astronomy um, as a kid, and even even nowadays, and. Astronomy requires a degree of humbling oneself. You know, this, understa this understanding that 
about about how about how small the whole um one one's particular spot is in the in the grand scheme of things the pale blue dot that um Carl that Carl Sagan had talked about when he was doing the old cosmos show and from a lot a lot of people i remember i remember a lot of people looking at Looking at this, looking at the state of "quote unquote" modern gaming in terms of in terms of video games, and saying, "Oh, the the industry is lost in doing that doom and gloom," and, and I saw it as I saw it as an opportunity, because when you have when you have a bunch of people who got who got run off from from work from working with the bigger companies, but still wanting to make games, they're gonna find a, they're gonna find a way to do it one way or the other. And like I said before, I've always been a treasure hunter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we live in an age where uh, a lot of dropouts from big companies uh, make Kickstarters or stuff like that to make, you know, the, the game they wanted to make with varying degrees of quality and success, of course. Mm -hmm. But again, human beings like. And I would r I would rather fail spectacularly than succeed minimally, but. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm 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 of the same school. Definitely not for everyone, but I, I kind of I'm, yeah, I agree. But, um, <laughs> now one of the other ones that's on that list, which it which amuses me because I've jokingly called this the edition I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because I didn't get paid. <laughs> is D and D fourth? Wow. Edition. Oh, okay. First of all, shots were just fired. Oh, I, um, I've been firing that. I've been firing that shot for years. I've I've told people you you want me to hate on this in the in the words of Goodfellas, fuck you, pay me. I I remember the like I I distinctly remember being uh, as I said before, you know, uh, unsatisfied with three point five, and I distinctly remember actually copying the enemy designs from fourth edition. Mm -hmm. into 3.5 and I also remember um, like going on a two-year hiatus uh, from TRPGs uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition was actually the edition that might have made me quit uh, TRPGs entirely but then I started playing a different game and that game was Pathfinder and if mm -hmm. this sounds stupid and silly it, it, that's true and I distinctly, I distinctly remember saying stuff like, "Yeah, uh, 3.5 had problems, uh, and I, we play Pathfinder now because fourth edition. Come on, that's not really role playing." And like this wasn't, you know, 12 year old me. Actually, 12 year old me was a lot better than that. This was like 19 year old me, and and like I I've gone back to fourth edition and to the stupidity and hypocrisy of those comments. And like, fourth edition uh, is really a game that's strange, but and, and I, it's the kind of game that I wouldn't play nowadays because there are more streamlined versions of the kind of playstyle. Uh, but it has been a big deal, and for Fabula Ultima, I would say that the main influence has been uh, literally presentation, like a game that knows that it's a game. And I'm I'm actually gonna raise you one more like I'm I'm gonna make this even more controversial. The biggest influence on the Fable Ultima layout is the fourth edition Essentials line, which people despise even more. <laughs> yeah, I I can I can certainly I can certainly see that in terms of presentation. I've I had I had remarked I I remember um when when fourth edition was being developed and they had stated that they want Instead of a tome design, they wanted a magazine design. Yeah, um, definitely. But and true, which truth actually be told, works well, you know, with with uh, JRPG guides because they usually look like they they have strong influence from magazines. Well, you you probably you probably skimmed through those alt, those um those alt, those Ultimania guides for various Final Fantasies. Yeah. Um and King, and Kingdom Hearts just as, just as much. And I've I've had my fair share of I I've I had a love for st for strategy guides for the for the longest time even even in games that I ne that They're I never great. actually played yeah uh, <laughs> same same I I find them super fascinating mm -hmm. but 
truth truth be told, my issue with my issue with um, essentials largely came down to how they to how they designed classes in the sense that they were tr they um, swung the pendulum too far the other way. It was yeah. I mean, some classes I really like. Like I, I think that the pendulum, depending on class, was swung too strongly or just strongly enough. Uh, I, but my my point was from fourth edition. The the main thing was fourth edition was finally, and probably too early. Uh, not probably, surely, definitely too early for its own good. It was a TRPG that talked about itself like it was a game rather than being your life. You know, it it didn't try to bring you in with cult-like seduction <laughs> uh, because 3.5. I, I remember like it. it I I have my uh, Dungeon Master's Guide here, and if you read that, like the introduction, it 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 seems like it's trying to to sell you an entire you know. A lifestyle. A, 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 it's trying to convince you that you are going to be better than other human beings just because you are the GM and are willing to go through that. Fourth edition, and to this day, even people that criticize it agree that the Dungeon Master Guide for Fourth Edition was great because it's a, it it's a guide that is concerned primarily with making the game work and with kind of you know avoiding people overcomplicating their stuff mm -hmm. like there why why are enemies uh, why why do enemy stat blocks work differently from pcs well because they are different they are game entities and you wouldn't expect you know and and it really it it didn't work with the brain of players because they were used to and had been trained to see enemies as you know uh built like PCs. I, I remember in 3.5, they were built exactly the same way. And it had, you know, a certain, um, I, I would say almost biological, like encyclopedic logic to it. Like ontologically, these entities were existed in the same world and thus were bound by the same rules. The rules of a fake uh, physics, a fake biology, a fake uh, nature of the world, uh, instead of being primarily seen as you know entities in a game, and and that's why actually I went with JRPGs. By the way, like I, you know, the tropes like when you fight the boss and when it joins your party, you know. Yeah, and the, like, yeah, and it's fifth, and it's fifteen or twenty levels on, and the boss is fifteen or twenty levels lower than the rest of your party. <laughs> exactly, and they and, and and in Fable Ultima it's the same. When you fight a, a champion, they have four turns per round, five turns per round, incredible abilities. If that champion becomes a PC by way of a redemption or stuff like that, you're gonna rewrite them completely with different rules. In 3.5 and still in fifth edition, and honestly, I don't want to say. That, Honestly, in a bunch of traditional games, because this is not just D&D, uh, a dragon is built to be a foe. If you have a dragon on your side, everything goes, you know, th the math explodes, because the entity still works the same way. Fourth edition was the first, at least in my experience, to openly say, no, NPCs are NPCs. Uh, minions, minions, like you have... At, at higher levels, you have minion Cyclops. An entire Cyclops has one hit point. And, and that's just, you know, profoundly cinematic. That's, that's a statement that has nothing to do with uh, verisimilitude and stuff like that. It's primarily concerned with giving you a proper game experience. Mm -hmm. So fourth edition, I, that was the, the big one. And rituals. I also have to mention the idea of rituals was half fourth edition and half uh, Final Fantasy, the fan-made RPG 3rd edition, mm -hmm. the... I, I, is it... it's called Spontaneous Magic or something like that. I think it's Spontaneous Magic. But the system was basically a merge of those two things um, to to make work the, the ritual system in Fable Ultima. Mm -hmm. Now, there is, there is one... there is one name that 
I found very interesting that, that I got brought up, and it's one, it's one that I've been championing for the longest time, and that is Tenra. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the, the death box. The, the exploration of death and sacrifice mechanics in Fabula Ultima came from the death box in, uh, in Tenra Bunch of Zero, and uh, the, the importance of uh, basically resting scenes, interlude scenes between big moments of action was another focus uh, from Tenra. And you could say that Tenra also had an influence on, on Fabula points, but mostly it's, it was really the, the death box. Uh, originally, in, in Fabula Ultima, it wasn't like today, uh, like nowadays, you when you hit zero hit points, you either surrender and no longer take part in the scene, uh, or you sacrifice yourself, lose the character permanently, and like achieve some big victory or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that back in the day, it was actually a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, when you hit zero, uh, you used to go into break and basically you recovered half of your maximum hit points and then if you if you went to zero again you would die and so basically choosing to go into break instead of surrendering was kind of like the death box in in tenra mm. uh it was taken away because it just killed the tension uh in tenra it works because you also gain a bunch of other bonuses and you're, you're basically signaling folks it's okay for me if i die now like that's on the table, uh, but I'm gonna be super strong in this scene. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Fabula, it really didn't work. It just made conflicts drag too much because there was plenty of ways for people to heal. So basically, I was giving everyone two life bars, and which basically meant I could just double the normal life bar. <laughs> um, like that, that would have been the same. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up making characters a little bit more tough. Uh, making healing stronger, more intense, but you still have to catch people before they hit zero, uh, which is one thing that uh, often, you know, throws people around. Because even, regardless, if they come from D and D, they are used to you go to zero and any healing brings you up. If they come from JRPGs, they expect a phoenix down. They expect a an item that makes you, you know, return to one HP, and instead. There's nothing of this of, of the kind, uh, because otherwise conflicts would be incredibly long. And however, uh, I find it fun that actually the best training for this kind of combat system comes from gacha games, because gacha games, uh, especially recently on Kai Star Rail, they have your character stay down when they are at zero because otherwise it would be too easy to make a defensive build and basically uh, be free to play. You, know, you wouldn't have that much of an incentive to get stronger characters. So the reason in gachas isn't really pure <laughs> for that, uh, but it actually works the same way in, in Fabula Ultima. And I'm, I, I've been known for when I bring the game to a convention or a demo, if whoever is playing the healer doesn't catch that someone had to be healed, I am known to, you know, rewind the action and tell them, you have, no you have, you have now learned that you have to heal people in, like, right before. Uh, and that's why in Fabula Ultima you alternate actions. Because I wanted, like, you can't get too shot by something because there's gonna be, 99% of the time, there's gonna be an ally turn in the middle and they can give you a potion or, or something. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to be lenient on that because people aren't used to zero meaning out of the scene, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, though, go, going back to one of the, one of the earlier things that was mentioned, the, the, that whole, that whole notion, that whole notion of, um, of that simulation idea, as opposed to acknowledging that you're playing a game. What I'm reminded of is one of the frustrations I've had in in the racing game when it comes to racing games of this insistence on a form on a form of realism that is uh, it is is utterly pointless. Not not to say striving for realism is, is pointless, but more of the hyper the hyper fixation on it 
to the point to the point where pe where people took the term simulator and for and forgot that the sole reason that it was called was called that was to differentiate itself from the more kart racing affairs. But at the end of the day, it's still a game. It doesn't matter how much CPU you put it you put into modeling tires. Your simulator is still a game, and in some cases, not one that's very good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a trap, like a, a pitfall that you can you can fall into, and and even one that you can build yourself depending on you know the the direction that you give the project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's really easy to to start with. I'm gonna do famous game, but better, and often that. You know, you need to first kind of review and examine what that game is about and what kind of priorities it has taught you. And like, obviously, we're talking about RPGs, so we we hear a lot of "I'm gonna do D and D, but better" and and uh, stuff like that. And while I can definitely sympathize, um, there is this there is this issue of actually people not having identified what D and D is for them and for others. And and I, I really want to you know, I, I said before that my favorite D and D is Moldway and Fourth Edition. And those games other than the brand basically have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. Um which is funny because we're talking about Fabio Ultima, which is inspired by Final Fantasy, which shares a similar, you know, situation in which two games are called Final Fantasy and you have a Marlboro and Cactuar in both, but one is a turn-based game and the other is an action game and you can't really say I like Final Fantasy like, you know, 360 degrees. Uh, and the same is for D&D &D for me. So like saying I want to make D&D &D but better ends up leading you into this trap of uh often adding more sim simulationist uh, elements, you know, to make it more realistic, to make armor class, you know, armor that works as damage reduction, all, all that stuff that actually I've, I've gone through all of it, I've been through it, and I think it's important to kind of go through that process, but uh, we, we really should, when designing stuff, we should go a little bit further. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that abstraction is always the best, uh, the best uh, option, but you are ultimately making a game, and a game first and foremost doesn't have to be you know realistic or believable, or a game has to be playable. That's that, that's that's the main concern. What it, I remember, I remember the tagline for the first Superman film: "You will believe that a man can fly." And I've ta I've taken my own approach my own approach to that ta to that tagline in the sense that it is how re how realistic um, something is 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 not is is only going to matter to a point and the people who use that at, and and it's important to not fall into the college know it all um, trap which is which is where a lot of the early days of tabletop came from especially. Where, especially where I'm from, and the thing the thing is with that tr the thing is with that is that it's is that you're appeal you're appealing to a minority of a minority of a minority. Um, I said a similar thing when it comes to um o over focusing on phys on physics engines because I would yeah. I would have yeah. people t I would have people tell me that um. That that F one is a F one is a bad racing game because it doesn't have a physics engine as good as R Factor two or or a set of course a competizione or so, or something like that. I'm like you cannot boil again. You cannot boil it down to physics. Um, yeah. The reason the reason why I had such love for Codemasters Run with F one was be was because of it of it um. Putting so much emphasis on the exper on the experience, not just the driving, but also also the engineering, having to deal with pit strategy, having to deal with um, yeah, all the th a all game the th a game is you know it, it's the sum of its parts, mm -hmm. which in, in our case and, and I would argue video games too includes the person who is playing, 
so y you have a limited amount of control, obviously, but your job is, and, and this is not just game design, this is more like experience design, uh, but we're, we're gonna go back to, to a thing uh, here. Um, you have to really take into account all aspects of the experience and um, one thing that uh, I really, really put a lot of work into when working on Fabula Ultima, for instance, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that people have noticed, uh, but I tried to break down information with, you know, it, it often, the ch text often changes color, like there are highlights and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And um, the graphic design, uh, I for the core book, I am basically, I've done everything except for making the illustrations myself. So yep. what you see when you get the core book is all me. Mm -hmm. uh, not, the, not the same for the expansions, which I'm actually really happy about, uh, because I, I like to see what people do when they take my stuff and, you know, and, and work on it and do development. But mm -hmm. I, I really spent a lot of time trying to nail the uh, strategy guide look, and because I knew that as good as my game design uh, could be, I needed to sell people on the experience in many ways, including visually. Mm -hmm. And this is not just, you know, people are going to judge a book by its cover. Uh, this is why character sheets are built the way they are. This is why the tutorial is structured like a video game tutorial. And uh, again, going back to people mis misinterpreting you could say that those are marketing choices done to you know have an appeal to a certain demographic but basically those are ways that i drive into the player the reader the idea to stick to jrpg tropes and video game tropes by means that aren't you know just the sentence i write that but some people, you know, they are more receptive to visual stimuli than, than just reading. Uh, and every single bit of a game is the game. Uh, the quality of character sheets, that, that's the game. Like, in fact, I would argue a character sheet is what you're going to look at most of the time. Like, <laughs> your experience with a tabletop RPG is largely going to be you with your sheet in front of them, in front of yourself. They can't be, you know, a uh, a secondary concern. Mm -hmm. John Harper has been super informative on this, and he begins his designs by character sheets. He doesn't write the rules, he writes the playbooks or the character sheets, because that's how information travels. And if I have one regret, it's that for me the character the character sheets for Fabula Ultima don't do a good enough job. Not because I didn't try, but because the game has honestly become more complex than a sheet can can honestly uh, handle and communicate. Which is why I mean uh, there's there's been talk of apps and obviously there's a community who who is doing interactive sheets and stuff. But as you said we can't get you know too focused on one thing only when the experience is many parts and all of them important yeah and and it's the i will i will say as as long as i don't have to deal with the one sheet hell that i had to deal with in the in my early days of world of darkness i'm perf i'm perfectly fine um <laughs> There, there's a reason. There's a reason why everybody was using Mr. Gon's um, custom sheets to the point where Onyx Pass just decided to cut out the middleman and hire him to do character sheet design for okay, the. For yeah, stuff. that that's smart, smart. Because sometimes you won't have the right person in your team, and honestly, I, I mean, for Fabula Ultima, that's Fultimator. It, it it's a free app, uh, browser app made by Trix, a, a dear friend of mine. Uh, who basically was running a Fable Ultima campaign and they were like, listen, I really like, they're a programmer by, by, uh, by trade and, and like, I, I need something easier than just writing the enemy stats in a, 
you know, uh, in a Google Doc, and basically he built a an app for it and just shared it with the entire world. And I'm I don't think I exaggerate when I say that a good thirty or forty percent of people that keep playing Fable Ultima do so because Fultimator exists, and that's an unofficial tool. Like. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't want to, you know, go into the discourse of letting the community build tools and not go after them when they do, because that's what keeps games alive. You, you don't want to discourage it. Um, but really, um, I, I think that sheets and, and, and tools and stuff, um, my, my, my promise for the future as a designer is to uh, think about that a lot more, you know, uh, not just in terms of accessibility, but really what I what I require of players and um, and what I I provide. Um, for instance, I'm I'm working on a project that's at the moment it's called uh, A Romance of Iron, uh, which is basically uh, Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, it's it's not a spin-off system to Fable Ultima. It's it's own thing. And well, that game is based on you know grid maps. And I demand I queen references. You you demand? Oh, queen references! Oh wow, no, that that that's a nice one. That's a wow. If okay. you're if you're gonna be referencing, if you're gonna be invoking tactics ogre, we a queen reference is mandatory. Indeed, indeed it is. <laughs> I agree. Um, but yeah, the point is, do we really like? How do we feel as designers? Uh, requiring that the game master be a level designer. And that's one of my biggest gripes with 4th edition, for instance. Like, uh, maybe we should provide ready-made maps that are interesting. And like, I, I, I think they didn't really have the time to go into that uh, too deeply. Because the game was supposed to be a lot more dynamic, while instead it often ends up, you know, being a the classic melee at the center of the map, uh, and and so I'm I'm like okay I want to make a game inspired by tactics that means that I either I provide an app so people that you know like Comp Con for Lancer mm -hmm. uh, like either that or I make a boxed set and maybe a system of tiles or maps and and those maps have to be designed to you know put. Uh, tactical thought to the test. So th they aren't just, you know, um, this is a castle, so there's going to be a wall and a tower. It, they don't just ha have to be natural, they have to be interesting from a gameplay standpoint. And this is all very challenging, And but I, I think that's the, that's the path I want to take. Like, I want to make games simpler and add complexity in stuff that isn't, you know, you have to remember more rules, but it's complexity that comes from accessories or items and, and things and props that you you bring into the game. So it, it's emergent complexity rather than complexity you have to study from, from the rule set. Yeah, and some... I know that some. Um, I know that some, I know that some people ha have advanced this idea that we need that we need to get away from co from complexity and and I'm I've I've always had this idea that it's a pendulum. You can swing to you can swing one way, you can sw you can swing the other way. But um, I did I will give I will give my, you my props for the recent release of the of the high fantasy expansion and it sounds like you're also working on a um expansion just for game masters if i'm uh, if i'm reading basically um the uh, there's the game master kit that has already came uh, come out in italian and we are working on an alternate uh illustration so basically, when the illustration is ready, there's going to be a second print of the Italian one and a first print of the English one. Uh, now, one thing I want to clarify, I do not follow distribution and production. So if you have questions, those should be asked to Neat Games, mm -hmm. because thankfully, they, they are the ones that, that uh, keep track of that. 
uh, and the Game Master Kit has the Game Master screen, which kind of makes it possible to play the game without the rule book. Like, you, you will not have to open the book uh, except for projects. Basically, everything is in there. I'm pretty proud of, of that one. Uh, and it also has this little booklet inside that provides Game Master advice and also a bunch of random charts for uh, boss gimmicks, uh, dangers and discoveries du during travel, uh, special abilities for enemies. Uh, like, it kind of, you know, as I, as I said before, I've provided a lot of guidance, but clearly not enough. And especially, I've seen that people that don't come from the uh, world of uh, turn-based RPGs, they struggle to understand, you know, how you build a gimmick boss that isn't unfair, you know, the, mm -hmm. the kind of puzzle boss. So I, I need to, to give more examples of that. Yeah. And that's one thing that basically has to be translated, but exists already in Italian. And we are going through revision for the Italian version of the uh, Techno Fantasy uh, Atlas, which is the second expansion book. Mm -hmm. And that one will come out in Italian uh, this fall and probably in English, I guess, next summer or next fall I, like I, I expect a one year delay between between Italian and English because um, to to translate them check them make sure they are you know the the quality level is good enough uh, that that takes some time uh, and then there's gonna be natural fantasy which I'm starting to write now in Italian and is gonna be the the third and final uh, expansion book, at least when it comes to the to the main line. Mm -hmm. um, there's talk of a bestiary. Uh, there's talk of, also of exploring, you know, and the possibility of a, of an uh, SRD, which uh, I've I've been trying to, you know, we've been trying to to talk about that, but everyone was really busy. But with the with the Ennis victory, I think that that's gonna get a a push forward. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of like the idea of making a player kit, although I don't know what to tie it to. Like the, the game master kit is with the game master screen. The player kit is I don't know dice, something. I I, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, I I don't want to you know send this message that game masters need more training than players. Uh, I I think being a Fable Ultima player absolutely is as important as being a game master and hey, turns out there's three or four of you so you are more important and have more weight than the game master in, when it comes to the to the outcome of the session mm -hmm. uh, and and then I don't know honestly I think my direct work on Fabula Ultima is probably gonna end next year uh, because as I mentioned I've been working on this since 2017 and it's kind of getting you know it's a long time, so I think for future stuff, it's likely that Need Games is going to assemble a team, you know, that's going to develop from it, and maybe I'll I'll be, you know, consulting or or uh, offering uh, uh, advice, but I'm not going to coordinate nor write directly because I I would like to explore new new projects, new fr new frontiers, as it were. Well, yeah, I. I, I, I'm really not the kind of designer who, you know, can do the same game for, for a lifetime. Yeah. Well, with that said, I do, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And it's been fun. It's been fun. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's more of Fabula Ultima, a general game design thing, or just a... Just a glorified shit post about everyone's mutual hatred of Marlboros. The door is always open. As I often say Thank around you. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you very much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.